So, um, thank you for the introduction. Uh, I'm going to be talking about, so in his introduction, he mentioned APG, which is API management. He mentioned Kubernetes, and he didn't mention Go, but there's a guy with a Go t-shirt, so whatever. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> so, yeah, so um, I'm going to be talking about all of those together at the same time. Uh, not APG, but uh, Cloud Endpoint, which is a Google Cloud way of managing APIs. So, First, a little bit about me, I'm a developer advocate, which means that I do two things. I go around and tell people about how awesome Google products are, and then I go back to product managers and I tell them they're not that good. <laughs> <laughs> what I do is I try to build stuff, and when it's cool, I tell you, and when it's not cool, I tell them. Uh, so, and I'm also a gopher. I've been working with the Go team for the last three to four years, after that. And I'm on Twitter, and I also host the GCP podcast which is the Google Cloud Platform Podcast, where you're two people, and we both have accents. So it's a fun thing to do. <laughs> so, I uh, wanted to know before I get started, how, who are you? Well, how are you too? How are you people? Uh, so, uh, how many of you have written Go code before? Okay, so around half. How many of you have used Google Cloud? Okay, uh, how many of you have used Aventin? <coughs> A container engine and Kubernetes, even it's not okay. Cool. So, uh, how many of you know what Swagger is? Cool. So, we're going to be talking about Swagger, which is not called Swagger, which is very sad because it's a very cool name. And now it's called Open API Specification, which is way more boring. So, uh, Google Compute Engine, that's not the slide I wanted. Oh. I had, a, I had another slide which was the, imagine that you see the Google, actually. <laughs> so, there you go. When you think about Google, you might think about this, and, and that is true, that is basically what we do, but to make this thing work the way it works, behind it there's actually lots of computers. Like, lots of, lots of, lots of them. We have data centers all around the world, and even before Google Cloud, we have them already. And basically Google Cloud, what it is, is we have these cool machines, why don't you use them? Uh, so, I'm going to be talking very quick about the three ways of doing computing on Google Cloud Platform. Uh, so the first one is Google Compute Engine, which is basically you get VMs. And you can do whatever you want with those VMs. You have root access and you can install whatever you want. You can install uh, whatever OS you want. Uh, you can install the ones that are on the list. But if you want to install micro kernels or no unit kernels or whatever you want to do, that's totally fine. You can also do it. And uh, some of them are very cheap, like less than one cent per hour, which is crazy cheap, but they're crazy slow. And then there's also the ones that are 32 cores with I don't know how many gigabytes of RAM, which are faster but not that cheap. Uh, so yeah, you can do lots of really cool stuff with that. But imagine that you build something, you have a very good idea. Like today we're gonna build a to-do list, which is the most successful idea. There's companies that have been successful with that, so why not? Uh, so imagine that you build that and people go crazy about it and share it with their friends and everything is awesome. And you are, uh, you get the slash, slash dot effect, which is the hacker nails of one time ago. Uh, you get that, and you get a huge amount of traffic. You have not expected that. How do you celebrate? Yay, everything goes down. And DevOps and like, no, no DevOps, like no ops is not a thing. If you are using Compute Engine, you need to figure out how to make things work. It is doable, but you need to do it. It is not automatic, right? So instead, there's another thing, which is App Engine. And App Engine is the other way of doing things. Like, rather than hey, I want to use these kind of machines with these OS, installing these things, or whatever. It's, I don't care. This is my code, run it. And it works incredibly well. Uh, there's some limitation, uh, limitations on what you can do. Uh, like, you cannot access the, uh, the file system. Because if you access a file system and you store data there, when you run it again, maybe you're in a different file system. So there's not such a thing. So there's a, a couple of constraints like that, which sort of makes sense when you want to build something that scales. But in exchange, you get something that scales like crazy. It goes from zero, like zero instances, and you don't pay anything, to crazy amounts of traffic. And then we say crazy amounts of traffic is 
is Snapchat creating the ones of traffic. Uh, Snapchat uses App Engine, Angry Birds uh, uses App Engine, Can Academy uses App Engine, and there's many of them. And but also my personal web page uses App Engine. And uh, other than being able to see that uh, I'm very bad at CSS, you can also see in that web page that it always works, and I don't make anything for it. Why? Because just like I'm not famous for you. <laughs> so the traffic that I get is super low, so you don't pay anything. So for personal projects, it works really well, but also for crazy traffic, also will scale very well. So, if we think about flexibility, we have com uh, Compute Engine, is the most flexible option, and the most automated one is App Engine. And then product managers love these things, where you have like the quadrants. So what is that star up there? That is Container Engine. And Container Engine kind of mixes both. You have a lot of flexibility. You can set up everything from scratch if you want to. But at the same time, there's a lot of the good practices on how to scale things that come directly with uh, Container Engine and Kubernetes. So it's based on Kubernetes. I'm sure you've all heard about Kubernetes before. It is just a way of managing uh, containers. And it is heavily inspired by how we do it at Google. Uh, at Google, we have been using containers, not Docker, but containers for ages. And we, I think that the official number is something like 2 billion containers per week, or something like that, which is kind of ridiculous. But it also doesn't mean anything, because they are container runs one second, who cares? But anyway, we run lots of them. And uh, also the cool thing is that you can run on, it's multi-cloud. So you can run this anywhere. You can run it on Amazon, you can run it on, on uh, on Google, uh, you can run it also on your premises, you can even run it on your laptop if you want to. Uh, there's a thing called Minikube, if you have not heard about it, it's pretty awesome. It's local development for Kubernetes. Check it out. Yeah? Oh, cool. It is pretty cool. Okay, so I'm going to write my back in Go, and that is one of the cutest Go aspects I have. Uh, so, in my opinion, uh, rather than me telling you about how cool it is to build something, it is better to just build it and let you decide. But I'm not going to be able to build the whole thing. So what I'm going to do is basically show you the beginning uh, of a little bit of Go, like how to write a, a, a web server in Go, and then like cooking, uh, pro cooking TV show. I'm going to be like, and there you go, a cake, right? So I'm going to show a little bit of the beginning, and then you trust me, and the rest will just. Cool. So, uh, I'm just gonna open new direct. Oh no, not there. Eh, good enough. Okay. So I use Visual Studio Code. Uh, it is pretty awesome. Uh, it's the first Microsoft product that I actually enjoy. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So. Uh, for those, that, for those that have never seen Go before, uh, Go always has one package main when it's a binary, and a function main that is the entry point. And then once you want to do anything uh, with HTTP, you say something like handle fun, handle all the requests to hello with a uh, handle. And then listen and serve. Uh, let me listen on 8080. And then I need to define handler, which is my HTTP handler. So you get all these two things. Uh, request and a response. Uh, response writer, which is where you write the response. So I'm going to do write into the app book. Hello, new, your. And that compiles. Yay. OK. So how do you run that? So. There's a couple ways of doing it, and that is sad that you cannot see it. I don't know how to do that. Actually, I know how to do that. There you go. Cool. OK, so uh, there's a couple ways of running it. The easiest way is go run. Uh, it runs go. So when you run it, it says, can I connect? And then I can do localhost 8080, 404.com, which is actually correct, because it is hello. Slash hello, the one that we Cool, easy. 
Now, what if I want to do something more complicated? Uh, I'm going to do something like hello name. This is now more like a REST API. Uh, basically, what I want to do is, depending on what you're giving me, I'm going to do something else. So imagine that it was not hello, but it was products slash product ID, something like that. So there's a package that allows you to do that, which is uh, from Gorilla. So new router. And when I say normally, no, there you go. Uh, so that is Go Imports adding my import statements. If you don't know Go Imports and you're in Go, use Go Imports. It is very good. Uh, so I'm going to just change this and this. So now I'm saying, OK, use this router, which is special, we've had, which has those variables, and allows me to do cool stuff with it. And now I'm going to say the variables are uh, the bars from R. So this extracts all the variables that I defined in the path. And now I can do bars of name. Cool. So that is a different one, slightly more advanced uh, way. And Obviously, yeah. So I can run my program again, and hello doesn't return anything. Hello, uh, my name, hello concept. Yay, it works. The next thing you might want to do is start using things like I want to store data, which helps. Uh, and this is something that I'm gonna I'm gonna use. There's many ways of doing this, but I'm gonna use data store. Uh, Google Cloud Data Store. And Google Cloud Data Store is basically just a non-relational database that is completely managed. And it is it works very well with a pension, even though I'm, this is not a pension, by the way, this is just pure code. Uh, but it, it works very well with, with anything that has to scale, because it scales very well with you. It, it, you don't need to add instances if you like you don't need to add read replicas or stuff like that if you want too much stuff. Uh, too many people reading, or you don't need to add uh, more disks if you run out of space. All of that is just automatic, which is pretty nice. And now it's when I'm going to go to my, that is toy, not the good directory. Okay. This is a full web up and go. And the important thing is that we have pretty much the same thing as before, this part here. I'm saying, OK, so if you get uh, get on to do, call the method list to do. If you get a post on to do, call the method at a to do. And if you get a get on a to do with that ID, that means that you should give me that specific ID. And then I'm defining the uh, so list to do's. What it does, it creates a list of to do's. And it uses the data store to create a query and say, give me all the to-dos. Uh, it is kind of like select star from to-do, uh, but instead it's non-relational, so they're called kinds, they're not called tables. And that's pretty much it. We get all of them, we check if something went wrong, uh, and then we cut it in JSON. And this is pretty much all the Go code we have. There's a little bit more than that. There's, uh, of course, the post to-do, where we decode first the JSON, and then we store it, and then we code more code, more, uh, more JSON, and then get one specific to-do, where we need to do more fancy stuff. But it's actually not that complicated. Uh, the code will be on GitHub as soon as Google allows me to open source it, which will be soon, hopefully tomorrow. Uh, but anyway, this is not very complicated. This is a very simple Go program. So let's run that one. Uh, so I can do a go run main.go. And this will not run because it says, I don't know what project ID is. It's like, oh, yeah, that's true. Uh, project ID, if I'm not mistaken, is actually I can do config. Can you put it here? Awesome. So, uh, config list. My project ID is this one. So I can do project ID equals this. Go around main .com. And now it's working. Cool. I can go to localhost 8080. Nothing happens. Uh, but if I do slash to do, 
nothing happens here. Because it's listening on board, nothing. Okay, my code is crappy. Port equals 88. Listening on board 88. How do you listen on port 0 and it works? It picks a random port. Oh, that's cool. Okay, I didn't even know that. It should tell me which one it is. Yeah, it should tell me. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay, so now that, that is JSON and it's clearly the three things that I have to do by mail, learn cloud endpoints, and do all the stuff. Uh, if I do give me that one, it works. And if I want to create a new one, I can do it with Postman. I don't know if you ever use Postman. If you need to test stuff with REST APIs, this is very useful. Uh, so I can do localhost 8080 uh, and send the message uh, description. Say hello to people. And when I send it, oh, uh, to do. When I send it, I get a response saying that is the new one that has been created. I don't know how to do that thing. Oh, there you go. So I create, I create a new one with a new key, and all of that was because of this. Cool. So we have something that works, and it works, which is really cool because it's running locally and authenticating with data store. And how is this working? My code is actually super simple. It doesn't, if I find it, everything it's doing is it's creating a new data store client with the project ID. There's zero authentication here, which is weird and dangerous, but not at all. Actually, what's happening is that there's this thing called uh, App Engine, no, Application Default Credentials. And it is because in my computer I signed in that is actually using uh, uh, some application. So it's basically downloading a JSON file with all the secrets and everything, but all of this is automatic, so you don't need to care about it, which is really cool. Okay, so the next step is we decided that we're going to be running this on Container Engine. Container Engine runs only one thing, Talk, actually more than one thing, not only Docker containers, Runs Docker containers and other flavors of containers such as Rocket or the new name OCI thing. I forgot. But whatever, it runs containers. And this is not a container, this is a binary, which is cool, but it's not cool enough. Uh, I can do go build, and that generates a backend file, which is a file which is a Mac file, which is pretty cool. But if you put a Mac, it's not a good GIF, look at that. Uh, if you put a Mac file in a Docker container, nothing will work. It is not a good idea. So how do I how do I make this happen? How can I Dockerize this thing? Let's go back to the Dockerizing things. Oh, that is the slide I wanted to see. <laughs> it is beautiful. There you go. Okay, so how to how to Dockerize your bucket? There's three main ways. The first one is using Golang package. And Golang, this is awesome, because if you do from Golang on build, that's it, that's everything you need to do. Your Docker file is literally from Golang do, uh, uh, column build, expose the port you want, and that's it, you're done. Which is very cool. And then you can add things on top of port. The problem that I have with this is that then you end up with a Docker container that has the C compiler, probably, and the Go compiler, and all the libraries, and the documentation, and bash, and all that stuff, which is awesome, but I don't want it in production. It is a bad idea. So you say, I'm going to use from scratch. And you know the joke of like, if you want to make a king from scratch, you need to first invent the universe. Same thing. Uh, if you use from scratch, uh, you're going you're gonna to have the tiniest uh, Docker container ever. But then you're going to try to use SSL, or DNS, or anything, and it's kind of like, oh, no, you need to add stuff, and then you're going to do, easy, apt get, and it's like, apt what? Not a thing. <laughs> so, if you want to do something that really uses just go and nothing fancy, great idea. If you want to do anything slightly more advanced, pain awaits you. Uh, it might work, and it might be worth it, but I could say it's probably not worth it. An intermediary solution is from Alpine. And from Alpine, Alpine is a pretty small Linux distribution. 
and it comes with basically nothing. There is no bash there, but it comes with apt get. So you can install things easily, which is very nice. So, you said this is a common object, common small package manager. Sorry? It's not yeah, it, so uh, Alpine comes with uh, an install. You said apt get. I think it's apt get. No, apk, sorry, apk. Which is, yeah. So it allows you to install things easily, which is my point. Yeah, it's not very easy to get. Uh, I don't know if you can read this, but this is the, this is the way I'm building my, my uh, Docker image. I'm saying from Alpine, and then I need to have uh, certificates to be able to use SSL. And it turns out that I can just do uh, install CS certificates, and that's it. And it installs it. If you want to do the, the question? Yes, there's no way to protect. We're gonna have custom there. <laughs> so anyway, so what I do is okay, I'm gonna need certificates because I'm doing HTTPS uh, to connect to other services. And uh, then I'm gonna add my binaries, backend is my binary, and then I set my environment variable, project ID import, and then I expose the port that I want to run, and then I just run that backend. That's it. And if you do this. Uh, so we're here, and I do docker build, gonna fail, uh, this builds, and it runs, and then I do docker run, gonna fail, and it says, what? Uh, you put a mac file in a docker container, what are you doing with it? So no, that is a bad idea, uh, but it's actually super easy to fix. Uh, so there's this thing called Goose and Gorge, uh, also known as GoOS and GoArc. Uh, so if you do Goose, Linux will build, that will cross compile and generate a Linux binary. And then you do, and still gonna call it gonna fail, uh, but it will not fail. It will fail for different reasons, which is fine. <laughs> And this is actually my next one. Uh, this will fail for different reasons. Uh, now this is working. And actually, the way I'm do, I do this, as much as it hurts to say this, I now like make files, which for a gopher is kind of a, yeah, it's, it's hard to accept. Uh, my build, what it does is go build, docker build, and delete that boundary. That is, my, that is how I build my, uh, my docker build. The cool thing is that this is super tiny and it is super fast. So uh, I think that the image at the end is like 12 megs, which for a web server is pretty cool. Okay, so let's go back to the problem. Okay, so when I run this, it says, yeah, I could not create the data store client because the default token source, uh, which is the, uh, the default credentials, I could not find it. Why? Because this is inside of a Docker container, it is not my computer anymore. Well, it is, but it is, it is not my environment anymore. So that authentication is gone. So how do you fix this? There's a couple ways. One of them is uh, doing the hard way, which is you download a JSON file from, so you go to cloud.com, uh, console.cloud.google.com, there you go. Uh, it, I just write C, and, and that's the one that appears. Uh, <laughs> So uh, you can create a new JSON file, download it, put it in there. Uh, you can put it in the Docker image, which is a really bad idea, because then if you publish that, you're publishing your authentications, which is not a good idea. But if you want to do it, it's your life. Uh, the other option is to actually map it into the, uh, into the volume, into the container as a volume, and never sharing that secret.json file. There's actually another way of doing it, which is just saying, you know what, I just want to put the one that I was using in my laptop, I want to use it inside of the Docker container. And that's what I do in my, in here, actually I have it, I have too many windows. <laughs> okay, so this is the one I said, this is what I, what I just tried to run. It said, uh, no, this is not going to work because you're missing, uh, you're missing authentication. What I'm doing there, I'm saying, use my jcloud config 
inside of the Docker container, and then it set that variable, uh, Google application credentials, to point to that file inside of the container. Yes? Uh, a good question. So, uh, what's the authentication protocol that they're using? What is the authentication protocol? Yeah, behind the scene. So, what this is doing is when you do uh, gcloud beta logging default application credentials or something like that, it's a very long command, but you do that, what it actually happens is that you open a window, a browser window, and you do the auth to authentication, and that will download a token, and will keep that token there. Okay, so it's an auth to token. token, yeah. So it's all auth to? Yeah. Okay. Is it implicit flow? Or? Is it implicit flow? I don't know that much about auth to, because I rather not. I but <laughs> Uh, it is basically the same one that you use when you try to allow uh, an application to access your Google data. That little window where it says, yeah, you have to ask this application to manage my applications, access data store, whatever you want to access. So you just pause the book on the next round, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so you do this once, and then the next time it's just already there. So you okay, so with doing this, which is actually what my uh, my Docker run does it does exactly that. I can do make start, and that started my container running in the background uh, in a map to localhost 8080. So if I go to localhost 8080, I should still get the same 404, which is perfect. Uh, but if I do to do, I still get the same list of uh, items that I have, plus the same hello to people that I added a minute ago. So these two are actually using the same uh, backing uh, data store. Cool. So now that we have this, I have way too many windows. Okay, so now that we have this, we, are, we have a container that works, which is good. Uh, when you try to deploy to container engine, that little thing there will not work. You cannot, you cannot mount the volume from your laptop into the world. That's not a thing, fortunately. Uh, so the way this will actually work is that container engine has those variables already defined. So actually, by deploying this to container engine, it will just work. Because it is also a Google environment that has been set, so that default uh, credentials just work around it, which is very nice. Again, I don't like Auth2, so here you don't even see it, which is awesome. Okay, so deploying to GKE. Uh, how many of you have used a con uh, con uh, container? Sorry, Kubernetes. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna go through a very, very light introduction to Kubernetes, like super, super light, uh, giving just basic concepts. If you have any questions, extra questions about it, we can talk about it, just move on. Uh, but basically the goal is, I want to run this super simple thing on Container Engine. I'm not gonna do anything else, that's why I'm using Data Store. So there's not a MySQL image that I have to run, there's just one single thing I need to run. So, we have container clusters, and Google Container Engine uh, is one way of starting clusters. It is actually very simple to create a new cluster. Everything you need to do is go to the console, go to container, and then click, click on new cluster. That's it. And it creates another cluster. You say how many nodes you want, and you will create it, something like this. So every single node, it, every single yellow box is a VM. And there's an extra VM on top, which is the Kubernetes master, or the GKE master. And that is the one that in GKE we manage. So that is the one that you don't need to care about. Uh, we make sure that it's always up. And if it's not up, it's not a problem because Kubernetes is actually designed to handle that correctly. So if the master goes down, nothing bad happens. Unless the master goes down for a very, period, a very long period of time and then things start to fail a little bit. But if it's a couple seconds, there's absolutely no problem with that. Then every single one of those machines are going to be running pods and pods are packages of containers, and you can have as many as you want in there. Very often it will be only one container, but you can have more, more than one. And these pods, the cool thing is that they inside of a container, inside of a pod, they all have the same IP. 
So all the containers have one single ID. So you need to make sure that if you have two containers in the same pod, the ports do not conflict. But if you're running things in different and different pods, you have different IPs. So you can have 1,000 containers running and listening on port 80 in only three nodes. Because every single one of those pods will have their own ID, which is very useful when you're trying to scale uh, to something bigger. Then we have replication controllers. And a replication controller, what it is, is basically you tell him, I want three instances of this. Make it happen. I don't care about, I'm not asking you to start to add three more. I'm telling you to have three, which means that if for any reason there's zero, you need, you need to start three. But if there's four, you need to stop one. So basically, it's you declare what's your desired status. You, you say, I want, at some point, I would like to have 10,000 of these instances. If you say 10,000 of anything on any computer, you will never get there. But that is fine. Because things will fail and people will unplug computers. And that is fine. Kubernetes will manage that to make sure that you get as close as possible to what you want. And then we have services. And a service is basically, uh, you can think about it as a load balancer. It provides a single entry point to all the things that are running a, ser a server. So if you have all the different web servers and you have 100 of them, which IP do you expose to the customer? None of them. You expose an extra one, which is the one that doesn't change. Because those pods might die all the time and they need to be moved around. So that is the static IP that you can So pods die all the time. So you should not care about them. They're going to be dying continuously. You can kill them and nothing will happen. Uh, so don't be too attached to them. Nodes will die too, but it happens less often. A node might die because if it's your own computer, it might die. But also if you're on the cloud, it may, you might get uh, an update or something, an outage or stuff like that. So this will happen and Kubernetes will take care of that. So it will actually move all the pods to all the places so uh, you basically are able to have the same load uh, regardless of the status of the machines. Then the replication controllers, as I said, what they do is they check what do I have now, what do I want to have, what do I have to do to get, the, to, to get there, that's it. And the services are the entry points. And they're the, the static IP import. So this is the one that you want to add into your DNS you have something or if you want to ex uh, expose this is the entry point for this API to use this, that is the one you, you want to use. So these are deployment. And my deployment here, what I'm saying is I want to run that, uh, that image. And uh, the image, that is actually something that I should have had a, a slide of this. That GCR that I owe, it is Google, con Google Container Registry. And it is a private container registry that is only accessible from your project. My project ID is Go Kubernetes Endpoints. So only my container, only my project is able to see those. Which means that I'm able to push stuff without publishing anywhere else. And then container engine will be able to pull them and start running. So you don't need to create things on Docker Hub, make them private, and make sure that nobody else, nobody else has access. Still, don't put your, JSON, your secret to JSON there. But if you do it, it is not that bad if you do it here. And then the important thing is also replicas. I want three replicas. So what I'm saying is, I want to be running three uh, of these pods. You see containers with an S? That is because there could be more than one. But in our case, there's only one. So I have that file here. It's the same thing. And to start this on container engine, uh, first of all, OK, don't look at that. Uh, but still, no. I should have done it before. You didn't see that. <coughs> there. 
So there is this tool uh, that I call K, but it's actually called QCTL, uh, that allows you to communicate with uh, your cluster. That cluster is actually a cluster running on Container Engine. I can show you that. Okay. So if I go to my Cloud Console, I'm able to do it. Okay. Uh, that is Container Engine out there. And I have a cluster that I created uh, today, and it has three, uh, three instances. So those are three VMs running there. And you can actually also, ah, and the container registry is there, so you can also see all the things that you've, popped, you've pushed, you've pushed to, uh, to the repo. And if you go to Compute Engine, you can actually see those three instances. Those three instances, they are running on Container Engine, but you still have access to them, and you can do whatever you want with them. You can kill them if you want to, if you want to have fun and see what happens. It is not a good idea, but nothing bad will happen really. Don't do it in production. Maybe, but more than that, you can. Okay, so I can do show me all the pods. There's no pods. Why? Because there's nothing else here. Uh, show me all the services. There is one service, it is the Kubernetes service, the Kubernetes API. If you want to interact from Kubernetes, from inside Kubernetes with the Kubernetes to start new pods or whatever you want to do, you have a REST API that you can use exposed right there on that port and IP. So, how do I create that deployment? Create-f uh, to do deployment that is stolen out there. What is it? Backend, okay. Uh, QCTL create-f backend deployment. Done, yeah. That's it, created. Uh, if I do get pods, you will say you have now three pods running and, and they're already there. Cool. How do I access them? Well, you can do kubectl <coughs> endpoints for the, no, that is for service, never mind. Uh, so if, if you do get pods, you can do kubectl describe pod and get the description of one of the pods. And you get a lot of stuff in there. But one of the things you get is that IP. That is the IP of the port. But as you can see, it's 10.0.0.58, which if I do from my uh, computer, it will say, huh, no. Uh, but there's a cool thing. And this is something that I really like to do, because everybody, either you know how to do it, and you're like, this is boring, or you've never seen it, and you're like, ooh, cool idea. So, uh, Ubuntu. Okay. QCTL run the image Ubuntu with go to sleep for 3,600 uh, uh, seconds, which is one hour, one hour? Yeah, one hour. Yeah. Okay. What, does it, what this does is create a new bot. You can see that bash bot right there. That doesn't do anything, it's just there sleeping. But now, I can do exec uh, on that bot being touched. And I'm connected to a, a terminal inside of Kubernetes. And I can do this because I have the authentication to do so. Uh, all the people outside kind of do it, otherwise they would be pretty horrible. Uh, and I can do a curl, and it will say, no, there's my curl, so uh, So, curl. Uh, that should be pretty fast because it's actually not over the Wi Fi. It's already running on Google Cloud. Yes, so that. Okay. Okay. And now, if I do kubectl uh, get pods, and I get the, it, the IP from that. That. I can go here and do curl 8080. What? Uh, 8081, because that's special. 
There you go. And you get the same JSON. So this is work. This is working. But there's a couple problems. The first one is nobody can access it. And even if you can, that is one of the bots. But I can go and be like, you know, uh, kill that. No, uh, delete that bot. And now that bot's not gone because uh, oh, delete pop, uh, delete that pop. And now that bot's gone, and a new one just arrived. Uh, that that one is not, it's one second old. So that's how fast it goes. So if I tell you that oh, use 10.0.0.135 in two seconds, maybe that is not bad anymore. Let's fix that. To do that, we're gonna de declare a service. And a service is based on this little thing we did here. That metadata, where we say labels app to do. You can put any labels you want in there. And those labels allow you to select what do you care about. So in here, what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna create a service that targets all the pods that match this metadata, which will be apt to do. But you can also have environment production, environment QA, and all these other things. So that is actually a very powerful thing. It's something that in, in Borg, which is the internal tool that uh, Google uses to manage containers, there's no such a thing. Uh, they try to add it. I, I got to interview John Willis, which is amazing. And he basically said that, oh yeah, Borg is awesome, but it's also incredibly complicated, so that's why we didn't, we didn't know that. Uh, Kubernetes has it, so use it. It's very nice. So, how do I declare a service? That's it. So, I'm saying my service is targeting that selector, app to do, matches the, light, the labels I had to uh, before. That is exactly the same thing. Uh, and I'm saying for a. So, I can do. QCTL, create f service, service created, and if I do QCTL get services, it will say there's a need to do service and the external IP is pending. Just by saying that the type was load balancer, what is happening now is that I'm creating an actual a virtual load balancer on Google Cloud Platform. And this works also for any other platform that you might use. So, possibly, sometime soon, this should create it. In the meanwhile, I can show you where it's created. So you go to networking, you're gonna be able to see it works. That is new, I'm confused. Load balancing, no, the router, no. Anyway, it's changed and I'm confused. Uh, yes, central, yes. I don't know. Oh no, default. That is pretty big. That is confusing. Uh, you agree okay, this has changed a little bit too much, so I'm confused, but what I don't think you exposed it yet. It, 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 is, it is exposed. Anyway, if you go into the console, you'll find it. Oh, it's it. somewhere. But now it, it's already created. We have it. So now we have curl that at 8080. It's say connection refuse, blue, connection refuse, 8081. Is it 8081? Oh no, I did something wrong. Uh, I'm almost sure that I'm doing. Yeah, it's 8081. So we're going to need to uh, delete the service. Uh, to do and create a service. So there's no port mapping. Your service port has to match the port. Yeah. Yeah. In this case, yeah. Uh, there's ways of, of making it different, but I just don't want to mix it too much. So how does the uh, load balancer like select which? Oh. Uh, is it a so. That is actually a slightly more advanced topic. Uh, when you do load balancer, what is going to happen is that load balancer is going to send the request to any of the three nodes that I have. But then which contain which pod actually replies to that is slightly more advanced. And it depends on the load balancer that you 
choose inside. You can actually create your own. I think that by default is from Robin, but I'm actually not completely sure. Uh, you can add, if you want something specific, like gRPC has a different load balancer, you can install it. Okay. But is it possible to believe that I can define the criteria that yeah. to scale automatically? Like to, yeah, to scale automatically, you can. So the cool, the cool thing about uh, Kubernetes is, uh, for instance, when I create that deployment, if you look at the deployment file, so here it says API version is v1 for the service. The service is something that is uh, built into Kubernetes. But if you go to the deployment, it says extensions. You can create extensions and create extra objects that Kubernetes doesn't really know about and just put it there. There is load balancers, there's and load balance is one of the, the, the ones that I think is actually defined in Kubernetes, but you can then implement them in different ways. And gRPC, for instance, it actually uses a list of what servers are available to actually uh, redirect and do run roaming over that list, nothing else. So you can implement those things. Uh, Kelsey Hightower implemented uh, that. So if you wanna if you wanna have a look, I can show you the I can point you to the code. Thank you. Okay, so did that work? No. What did it do? Anyone? Oh yeah. Cool. Yay. Okay. So now we have something that works. Uh, it works everywhere. It's amazing, and you can now access it and mess with my to-do list if you feel like it. Yes. So if the container running the service, if that container then uh, yeah, Kubernetes agent would. Restart the container. Yeah. Uh, so IP, IP will remain the same. Sorry. The external IP will remain the same. Yeah. So right now, if you want, we can do uh, delete that pod, and you can keep on doing to do, and everything will work. You can even do something that I'm not going to show because we don't have time to do. Uh, but uh, there's a what we call a rolling update. So you can be having. Uh, like uh, do this request all the time, once per second, non-stop, and at the same time change all your containers and the servers will, like your client will not notice. Because what happens is that it actually changes one pod from version one to version two, waits for it to say I'm ready, and then goes to the next one. So you can do those things. And it, it is very powerful because basically it means that migrating is much easier and safer. If something goes wrong, that container will never say I'm ready, Code it's bug free, which should. Uh, if it said if it never gets to the state I'm ready, then your migration will just stop. Uh, there is billing involved. Uh, it's okay. Yeah, it, there is billing involved. <laughs> show you. I can show you. I'm not paying for it though. Uh, so for now it's zero. I've been running it all day. Three instances, and for now it's zero. It might be good, it's not updated yet, but it is not expensive. Like those instances are the normal ones, which are maybe half a dollar per hour or something like that. It's less than that. I don't know, the cheap ones. I don't know. I don't know if Google is expensive. Huh? It's expensive. You can compare it to others. They give me $300, and I, it finishes in like less than a month. It's expensive. What did you do? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, to be honest, I. Like I was doing an experiment, I was computing pi, not all of it, just a couple billion <laughs> of the, like a billion digits. Not all of it. Not all of it, because you know the money is not infinite. Uh, and I spent like, I think it's like two thousand dollars in a month. But I had like big table and stuff like that, which is like big things. To spend three hundred dollars on compute, that is, I mean, it's doable. I can help you do that if you want to. But it is it is hard. Also, I can give you a credit if you Yeah, please. So, yeah, we, we can talk about that later. Not all of you. <laughs> Calm down, people. But yeah, I can, we can talk later. That's really fine. There's one question I have. Yes. With Kubernetes, I'm still using uh, deployment. I noticed that when I'm doing deployment, also in Minikube, because if you look at the API version right now, it says beta. And a lot of people have said that because it's beta, it has given them problems. So because of that, I use the create deployment on on the terminal instead of um, create the files. Yeah. What's your opinion on that? 
is it? So you have issues running Minik here? Uh, no, I'm just saying, we have already uh, Kubernetes coming on Minik. Because I run both environments, also local and uh, AWS. Having said that, I'm saying my deployment, I, des I, I describe it on the terminal instead of yeah. running the file. It should, it should work anyway, so we can check it out later. I have not had that issue. So we can have a look later. Let's take a little bit. Minikube is super new, like super, super new. So there might be bugs. I could not be shocked. Uh, OK. No more building. Or, OK, cool. So now we have our application running on the cloud. And that is awesome. And uh, I want to go quite quick over the Open API initiative, also known as Swagger, which is a much better name. It is a declarative format in YAML, so what we just saw uh, for the for the Kubernetes files, exactly the same format. You can also use JSON, but I think JSON is way worse than YAML. YAML is crazy easy to, to edit. Uh, and it provides introspection and then introspection onto your own API. It allows you to do cool things like generate documentation and tooling and even generate code. It can generate code for your server, which is cool, but I've never done that because I don't want running my server. Thank you very much. Uh, but what you can do is write a specification to match what your server is doing. And then anyone can build their client from that. So you don't need to generate JavaScript and Swift and Java. Instead, you just give that Swagger API, Swagger spec, and anyone can build it from there. It's kind of like gRPC, but a uh, little bit different prefer GRPC, but that's a different topic. Um, so, let's see that declaration. Uh, where did that go? Okay, so this declaration, I'm gonna go a little bit little. Uh, there's not much, there's not much to do, uh, to see. Uh, this swagger to the zero, and this is my information about my app. Uh, it's a to do app, which is version 1.0.0. Uh, and this is the host uh, that I will change for the demo. But this is where I would like to have it at some point. It's still not there, but that's fine. Then you say it's games. I'm also only serving HTTP. If you want to serve HTTPS, we'll talk about that at the end of the And it generates JSON. And there's a bunch of things. If you do get on to do, you get a list of item, to do items, and if you want to generate code, uh, that should be called get all uh, for the, the code. And the responses can be either 200, which will return an array of to dos, and the schema is an array of to do, and that definition is at the bottom. Uh, otherwise, it can also return an expected error, which the schema is also an error. Also, you can do a post on that uh, slash to do slash, and that will call at one. And the parameters are to do, which is inside of the body. Uh, so it's actually something that you're sending in the body of the post request. And uh, it's the to do to be added, and that is the type. And it will return either 201, which is created, or uh, error. And then finally, you can do that thing, which is like in Go, same thing. Uh, if you do to do slash ID uh, with get, you, can, you will get, uh, so you get a parameter. That parameter is in the path. Uh, so that's why it's to do slash something. It's in the path, not a query or anything else. And it's a string, and it returns either 200 with uh, the to do itself, or a default, which is an error, something bad happened, maybe not. And then the definitions is uh, to do is an object that has two fields, ID and description, and they're both strings, and uh, the ID is read only. An error is something that has a code and a message, which is one is an int and the other one string. That's it. So I wrote this, and I gotta admit, writing this using just an editor is kind of painful and boring, but you do it only once, so that is better, I guess. But I'm looking for the cool thing is that this is actually an open, uh, an open uh, standard, so there's a lot of people working on tooling for this for me. Something that I hope with the experience will be better. So, if someone knows about tooling to make this easier, I'm very interested. So, the cool thing now is that I can do 
you can go to editor.swagger.io, which is an editor of Swagger, obviously. And I have exactly that thing there. And I'm running it on localhost 8080. You can also be running it anywhere else. So by just generating, by just having this, so right now there's nothing, so it fails. By just having this on a specification on the left, on the right side, I get this full documentation, which is actually pretty nice. And you get this for free. So now if anyone wants to use your API, this is already there for them to try, which is very nice if you are exposing this to other customers. Even if you're getting this awesome. And you get to get, and if you do get, you can see that it will return 200, uh, and uh, it will be a to-do, which is a description. And you can try the operation, and you can run it, and the server is not running. Is it running? It's going to 88, 81. So. Uh, I, keep on, I should have not changed that right before coming here. All right, let's try that. Change map. We don't play anymore. What? What? Base map. Oh, wait. I'm just going to base map. What is base map? No, this is, I think this is fine. Let's try. OK, so if I run this, it'll be. Oh, what have I done? Uh, oh, that is. So I got a demo. OK, the copy paste did not work at all. OK, now it worked. Cool. So that is local cost, maybe it will. Uh, let's try it again. Try the operation. Set request. What? Okay, let's try that. Actually, that should be. Uh, yeah. I broke it. Okay. That, I guess that my Docker container is not running anymore, which kind of makes sense. OK, so uh, now I'm running this, and I'm saying, OK, so I want to try the get. And you can see here, you can see the output of all of these things. You can also see the pretty, which is relative. And you can see raw, which is definitely raw. Uh, so you get all of these, uh, all of these uh, <clears throat> for free. You can also get one of them. Actually, let's do a post. Let's create a new one. You can see the parameters. There's a, a to-do, which is in the body. It's the to-do to be added. So you can see all of these documentation comes for free. And you can try the operation. And see that ID is redundant, so you cannot write it. And uh, fix my demo. This. And no. Why? Why? That, that would make any sense. Uh, Let's imagine that that works. And, <laughs> and uh, you can also do, if I do get uh, one of the things that I got here, that should also work. So, and that would work. Yay. OK. And then you can see the documentation there. So imagine that you have a very, very big API. Having this for free and having the JSON, uh, the JavaScript clients, and the, and the Android and iOS client generated automatically, it's pretty awesome. Now, why do I care about this also? Not only because it's pretty awesome by itself, but also because you can actually deploy it directly onto Google Cloud. And when you deploy it into Google Cloud, I broke it, good, okay. What you're gonna do is you're gonna use Google Cloud Android. Google Cloud Endpoints, everything you're doing is you're getting that YAML file and sending it to Google, saying, please, have it. And what you get in exchange is something that is beta. So my, like if my demo didn't work, imagine this. Uh, so it is something that is beta, and we are using it now currently. There are some customers that have been using it for a while. They're very happy with it. But we might change the API. Uh, so you will be work. But it's something that you can use on almost everywhere, except for Apache and Classic, for now. Uh, so you can use it on GCE, on GKE, on Apache and Flex, uh, and anywhere else, meaning that you can run it on your own machines. You can run it at the 
the, uh, the servers themselves could be running on different clouds if you want to. It's a multi-cloud solution too. And it allows you to have authentication and monitoring and management. The one I care the most about is authentication. It allows you to have things like, uh, like uh, API keys. So you manage API keys in a very simple way, which is if you use any Google API, you might have used one of those. It is very, a very simple way to do it, but also it manages Firebase authentication, and it manages also Google Toolkit authentication, and also Auth0 authentication. So if you want to use any of those, there's no effort on your side to implement those. Again, I don't like Auth2, so the fire then comes for free, yay. So the way you do it is, um, actually I'm not gonna show how to do it because we're out of time. I'm going to show what you get. Uh, endpoints. Endpoints. You get that, which looks very sad right now because there's no traffic. But when you click inside, you can see that I was trying it before and it used to work. Okay, so you, you can see all the requests, how often they're arriving. You can see the tracing, you can see the logging, uh, you can add security, uh, so you can also share that API if you want someone else to be able to manage it, other than people that have access to your project, they can also do that. And you can also create, uh, when you do API manager here, and credentials, if you create an API key, you can also give this to someone and say, you're going to use this API key to access my API. If you don't use this, you will not be able to do it, which is a very easy way to handle codes also. So there's a couple of things that I did not mention during the presentation. Uh, actually, authentication, I mentioned that it exists, but not how to do it. Documentation is there, not that complicated. Especially if you're gonna use Firebase Auth or API keys, they're super simple to use. And then security, uh, everything here was over HTTP, which is not awesome. If you wanna do HTTPS, there's a couple ways of doing it. One is getting your own certificates and installing them and managing the whole thing like we used to do, like a year ago. Uh, the other way is there's a Kubernetes project uh, that allows you to basically have a certificate manager as something running on Kubernetes managed with Let's Encrypt. Which means that the whole uh, management of the certificate will be done automatically for you. Which is pretty awesome because then you get certificates for every single one of your pods just automatically without having to do anything on your side. And thank you. So I don't know if you have any questions. I'm going to be around. Also, there's Google Cloud Platform Seekers. There's slightly bigger Google Cloud Platform Seekers. And there's some, not many of them, but very rare, go for Seekers. I know. So you're going to come get one. Yeah. Uh, the question uh, more about local development, I guess. Might more of a data store, but how do you recommend doing local development or testing or anything like that if you're connecting to the cloud data store or so, you so you're in isolation? So for the cloud data store, there's two options. Uh, one is doing what I did and basically actually connecting to the remote data store. But then in that case, have two different environments, one for product and one for test. Uh, but if you're going to do that, there's actually a better way of doing it, which is there's a data store in there. So you can use the data store emulator that helps a lot. And we're building data store, no, not data store emulators. We're building emulators for every single problem. So uh, hopefully soon there will be also for cloud storage, for Memcache, for all these things. Yeah. If you're using a benching, that comes for free. There's already <coughs> Yeah, so. It's not the same thing. No, so APG and uh, Google Cloud endpoints are different things. And it is very exciting. <laughs> That's every day I can say. We basically for 
RPGs minus. I cannot uh, talk about that, but no, not that. Uh, RPG is an amazing company with awesome engineers, so it's actually very exciting to work with them. And yeah, what's going to come out from mixing our cloud with their management APIs? I don't know, but I'm pretty sure it's going to be cool. Any other questions? Oh, there you go. Oh, that there was right behind you. There was someone else. Sorry. Yeah, go for it. Yeah. I mean, how, how does the certificate management work you know, with the pods? The pods are coming up, dying. So, a certificate manager would, uh, uh, I mean, recycle the certificates amongst the pods? So, I'm not completely sure, but normally I could assume that what happens is that you have one certificate for deployment and they're shared because it's exactly the same service, so you don't really need to have different certificates. But I'm, I have not tried that, so I don't know. Normally, I could assume that basically creates a new uh, volume that you can find in your containers, and that that volume has the certificates. But I'm not completely sure, and I'm sure there's different ways of doing it. That is the the URL for CubeCert Manager. That is the one that you want to check out uh, if you're interested. Um, there was a question right there, or? Yeah, I was going to ask you. Um, I'm not managing my um, like environment, because I live in Kubernetes. I, what if I don't want to use, um, if I'm using Kubernetes and I don't want to use NCD, how do I manage my, my, uh, my environment? If you want to use Kubernetes but not NCD, uh, it is hard to do, but if you have another project that allows you to have the same features, you could be, you could do that. Uh, it is you need to modify some code and stuff like that, I'd say. Because etcd is really like the basis of uh, Kubernetes. It's like work without chubby, which is the like general thing, will not really work and it's really hard to do. And it's pretty much the same idea. So uh, I don't know. If you want, we can check it out. I've, ne I've never heard anyone trying to do that. Because I'm using your big car already. Um, oh, OK. So I'm using your car, which is uh, a nice tool. You, you can, I'm sure. Like it is actually the, the whole Kubernetes uh, frame, framework, basically, it's built so everything is replaceable. Absolutely everything. How easy it is to replace pieces, it depends on how important they are. So the etcd part is quite important. So I'm not sure how it's going to be. Yeah. Uh, so is there any technical support like for where you can actually pull secrets from the Google well, like for example, if you want to store some certificates, yeah. some passwords, and you kind of have it about it. So, so you yeah. don't want to put, even though it's in Google Cloud, you don't want to put anything in that. So, so the place we can fetch it. Yeah, so there's two ways of doing that. Uh, the question is, uh, what do I do with secrets? Uh, if you're running on Kubernetes, there's Kubernetes secrets, which is already a thing in Kubernetes. And uh, it is basically a vault that you can use, and it's attached to Kubernetes. If you're doing something that involves the Kubernetes and other things, uh, my recommendation is using Google Cloud Metadata Server. And the metadata service allows you to put anything in there, but everything is encrypted and safe. So it's not called secret. And it doesn't look like it's secret, because when you see it, it shows it all the time. So I could use it for passwords and stuff like that, probably. Uh, for things that are actually secret, I think that it is kind of easy to get to see it if you have the credentials. So it is, it is more like maybe. But Kubernetes secrets works very well. And there was a question, right? Oh, yeah. I was going to ask about emulator. You said that I already, I already use dev app server the local version. That is the no, for Avenger, yeah. yeah. That's the emulator you're talking about, right? That is no. Like, so Avenger, the uh, Avenger emulator, uh, so the Avenger local server, uh, it emulates data store and mail and a bunch of other things. The problem is that if you're running on other places, like my code here is not running on a function. How do you manage that? How do you uh, have a fake data store? And that is the services that we're working on. Yeah. Is there any firebase No idea. I don't think so. It is, yeah, that is, that is slightly hard to do. Uh, I open sourced something yesterday, which I think might be interesting for some people, so I'm going to show you. Uh, if you're interested in Go development for Aventing itself, 
I open source this, I run it yesterday a uh, minute ago, and it is like eight hours. If you want to do it all the way, it's like eight hours of uh, work, uh, running Go code. It's a, I'd say, pretty good way to learn Go. <laughs> but I created it, so I'm maybe biased. <laughs> yes? My credit. Oh, you're credit. Yeah, come here. <laughs> okay, so if there's, no, if there's more questions, you can. Go and find me here, or you can send me an email, or let me go back to the slide here. You can find me on Twitter, and also emails and stuff. Also, please fill out the survey.